Now, all of you know that we're here, among other things, to celebrate the appearance, the publication of a book, a very handsome book, Jews and Ukrainians, A Millennium of Coexistence. And we're fortunate to have the two authors, Professor Magolchi and Professor, Professor Yohanan Petrovsky Stern, with us here today. The book covers a big topic, a millennium, coexistence. And it seems to me we would not be doing justice to the ambition of the book, to the scholarship of its authors, if we did not engage its contents deeply and also critically. If we did not think about the scholarly and the ethical issues surrounding not only the book, but the larger question of Jewish-Ukrainian dialogue. So to that end, when we set up this symposium, I invited each of the speakers to choose their own area to emphasize. Um, they can talk specifically about the book, or they can engage more broadly issues around Ukrainian Jewish encounters and dialogue. But I also want to start by asking you, as the audience, to think about what's at stake in this discussion. It's so easy to use those words, coexistence, dialogue. They roll off the tongue. In his comments yesterday, Professor Petrovsky Stern reminded us that, of course, it hasn't always been easy. That some people, he talked about Ivan Chuba, have gone to prison for comments that they made about Jews and Ukrainians, Jews in Ukraine. Even in our world, looking around the audience yesterday, thinking about who was present, thinking about who is involved in the Ukrainian Jewish encounter, I was reminded that we too have people, many of them Jews, who have devoted their energy, their time, even their lives to promoting dialogue and understanding. People whose own families were killed on Ukrainian soil, some of them by Ukrainians, it's a high cost, the dialogue we're discussing. I also thought about the wealth of scholarship, particularly on the World War II period, my own area of expertise, scholarship dealing with Jews in Ukraine, Jews and Ukrainians, much of it written by people from Ukraine, ethnic Ukrainians, also Mennonites, ethnic Russians, ethnic Poles and others, some of them our own graduate students, people who, at a very high personal and professional cost, risked looking into the past to find things that could be very, very difficult for them and their communities. But they did so because they were committed to something about truth, and the kind of truth on which a person can build relationships and communities with integrity. So ladies and gentlemen, I probably don't need to remind most of you here, but this is very serious business. And for that reason, we're very fortunate to have with us here at the podium five very serious scholars who will help us address these issues and examine them from a number of different angles. I'm going to introduce them all first. Each of them is going to give a formal statement around 15 minutes. Then they're going to give just a very brief response to the others. And then we'll open it up to your questions and discussion. And after that, the reception. So our first speaker will be Professor Anna Sternschus, who holds the Alan Malka Green Associate Chair of Yiddish Studies and is director of the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, as mentioned here at the University of Toronto. She received her doctorate at Oxford and is the author of Soviet and Kosher, Jewish Popular Culture in the Soviet Union, 1923 to 1939, and also of a book that will appear in just a few months called When Sonia Met Boris, Oral History, and Oral History of Jewish Life Under Stalin. Professor Sternsch is co-editor in chief of East European Jewish Affairs. She will be followed by our second speaker, Ori Yehudai, who's a visiting assistant professor of Jewish history here at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on modern Jewish and Israeli history, 
and in particular on Jewish migration and displacement. His PhD is from the University of Chicago. He has won many fellowships and awards from the American Council of Learned Societies, the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Wiener Library in London, and the Israel Institute in Washington, DC. He's currently writing a book on Jewish outmigration from Palestine and Israel between 1945 and 1967. After Professor Yehudai, we will hear from Professor Frank Sisson, who is director of the Peter Jackson Center for Ukrainian Historical Research at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. He's also a professor in the Department of History and Classics at the University of Alberta, and he is a member of the Academic Council of the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. He's the author and editor of many publications. I only want to mention um, two titles. He's the co-author with Sergei Plochy of Religion and Nation in Modern Ukraine, and the editor-in-chief of the three-volume collected works of Father Mikhailo Zbritsky, um, Volume 1, Scholarly Works, Volume 2, Toward a Biography. Our fourth speaker is one of our two authors. Many of you heard him yesterday, so I don't have to maybe give the full details. Professor Yohanan Petrovsky Stern is the Crown Family Professor of Jewish Studies and a professor of Jewish history at Northwestern University. He has also been a visiting professor at universities all over the world, in Paris, Kiev, Lviv, Warsaw, Krakow, Munich, Boston, and Jerusalem. He's the author of more than 100 articles and six books, most recently The Golden Age Shtetl, well, not as recent as this one, The Golden Age Shtetl, A New History of Jewish Life in East Europe, um, which won a national Jewish book award. And finally, our final speaker, the other co-author of the book, will be Professor Paul Robert Magochi, Professor of History and Political Science here at the University of Toronto, and as mentioned, holder of the John Yaremko Chair of Ukrainian Studies. He is also the author of many, many works. Many of them will be familiar to you. I'm again only going to mention a few titles, maybe my personal favorites, A History of Ukraine, The Land and Its Peoples, a book called Of the Making of Nationalities, There is No End, two volumes, another quite recent publication, 2014, This Blessed Land, Crimea and Crimean Tatars. Professor Magochi too has taught at many other institutions, at Harvard University, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, at Preshov University in Slovakia, and he holds a number of honorary degrees. So our speakers will each give, as mentioned, a formal statement, a short response, and the question and answer. And I invite Professor Sternschus to take the podium. As I said yesterday, we're thrilled to, putting my administrative on, on, hat on for a second, we're thrilled to be working with Professor Magachi uh, on this uh, event. Now, I'm uh, going to talk about the book and what it made me think about from two perspectives. One is my perspective as a Yiddishist, as a scholar of Yiddish literature and culture, and another one is an oral historian. Now, but before that, if one stops and thinks about it, there is nothing, nothing unnatural about putting out a volume entitled Jews and Ukrainians. Major developments in Jewish history took place in Ukraine, Hasidism, for example, or Israeli Nobel Prize winner Shmuel Agnon was born there. Sholem Aleichem, arguably the most popular Yiddish writer who ever lived, comes from Ukraine. Speaking of Yiddish, Yiddish, they say, no, the, uh, Yiddish, an important Jewish language, uh, they say can only be translated with a, deg with a reliable degree of accuracy into Ukrainian. Not English, everyone knows that, not French, not even Russian or Polish, but Ukrainian. Having said that, I still remember the voice of my former professor, David Roskis, the Yiddish literature professor, um, who taught us in numerous classes in grad school 
uh, back in the Stone Age of the 1990s, that Sholom Aleichem and his predecessor, Abramovich, better known as Mendel Amoichis Forum, both originating from Ukraine, brought classics of Yiddish literature, never mentioned Ukraine by name in their novels. All of this, that all of their novels took place in Ukraine, but the reader wouldn't know it. Jews constituted, as the book tells us, at some point, one in about nine people living in Ukraine. The book cites in 1897, there were two million Jews living in Ukraine and 17 million Ukrainians. And it discusses numerous instances of cross-cultural fertilization between Jews and Ukrainians over the course of their long history of coexistence. So why is it so unusual, so controversial, and so troubling to talk about the encounter in history? Why are there so many unanswered questions? The authors of the book, my colleague Bob Magachi and Johanan Petrovsky Stern, know exactly why. In fact, they start the book on page two with a list of stereotypes that Jews and Ukrainians hold against one another. I won't recite them here, but I have to tell you that as a Jew growing up in Russia to Ukrainian-born parents, I heard almost all of them about Ukraine having little respect for Jews on the Jewish side, about uh, not only Jews being killed in Babi Yar, and then why make a big deal out of it, and why make a big deal out of Holocaust on the other side as well. When I moved to the western part of the world, first to England, then to the United States, and then finally to Canada, I learned more about Jew history of Jews in Ukraine, and I learned more of those myths. First of all, I learned that there were pogroms. I didn't know that when I lived in Russia. Then I learned that Cossacks were involved in these pogroms and were killing Jews. I also learned that Holodomor, the famine, is perceived as communist-made, Jewish-made attack on Ukrainians. Both perceptions were very hard for me to understand, especially that I knew about so many Jewish families who died in famine and heard of Jewish people serving for Petlura, but also being killed by Petlura. But one thing seemed clear. New information came in, but the myth of mutual hostility and distrust of Jews and Ukrainians got stronger in my head, and not only in mine. My work on oral history of Soviet Jews, during which I conducted over about 500 interviews with Soviet Jews born in the 1920s and earlier, about 350 of them were born in Ukraine, only confirmed this perception. Jewish people who grew up in various areas of Ukraine and who survived the war under the Romanian occupation or in Soviet Central Asia or served in the Red Army usually had good things to say about their immediate Ukrainian friends and family, but had almost nothing but negativity for Ukraine as a country, as a land. If anything, they refused to call themselves Ukrainian Jews, but instead called themselves Russian Jews, or more often, Russians. But, as the book, the authors of the book remind us, the historical accuracy of myths have no relevance to their significance. And the book takes on a very ambitious task of writing a detailed yet brief history of Ukrainian and Jewish history in Ukraine. So, as they say, both Jews and Ukrainians learn about one another and about themselves. Now, the book is very rich with facts, data, interesting observation, and I think it's exemplary in how it looks. I couldn't stop but admiring it. The glossy paper, beautifully selected illustrations, nice, easy to read font, big margins, all these things we take for granted, but they make such an important difference. I think that will surely end up on coffee tables and mental pieces. And um, the... Um, a few things that I'm going to say about, uh, you know, things that I started thinking about as I was reading the book, um, they're not meant to, they're not meant to criticize the project, just meant to think, to, to provide kind of the things, uh, the avenues of uh, further research it might inspire, as I think it should. Now, I know that writing a summary of a big project always comes with choices. You have to make a decision every single moment, which story goes in, which story doesn't, and why is that? But 
One of the things that uh, was interesting to me to think about and that uh, struck me as uh, unusual is that in both histories of Jews and Ukrainians, I did not notice uh, many women. I mean, they appear in small numbers. I know women lived in Ukraine and Jews, uh, among Jews and Ukrainians. You know, that's how humans uh, procreate. You know, they, they have to be mothers and daughters and all this. But um, women were discussed for the first time on page 102 in the context of hairstyles, the braids. Well, I have to admit that my daughters were certainly very interested in that part of the book. I'm intimidated by braids, I have to admit. But it seems to me that the volume uh, could have given a little bit more voice and agency to women uh, and make them more integral part of uh, the historical narrative in context of events and, of course, the context of violence. And the reason I bring up violence is that um, in discussion of uh, pogroms of the 20th century, it seemed to of the early 20th century, it seemed to me that bringing up women would have been very important. We learned from the book that there were about 50 to 60,000 Jews who were killed during the pogroms in the early 20th century. About one million of them were displaced and 100,000 children orphaned. But what's not mentioned is the sexual violence that affected in some places of Ukraine over 70% of women who lived there. And it devastated communities to a large extent, some people might argue a large extent, than looting and physical destruction. New work in the field by Jeffrey Weidlinger, Irina Stashkevich, Elisa ben Porat began to address those issues in the English language literature, but already existing and published Russian and Yiddish language sources, especially the archive by Cherry Cover, which I know the authors consulted, um, talks about this in quite detail, and I think it's really important to think about this in the context of, the, um, of both Ukrainian and Jewish history. Now, speaking of women, I was also thinking, also as an oral historian, you can't get that hat off yourself uh, very easily. I wanted more people. I wanted to know how these people, individual people, make decisions, how they make their choices, how they work, where they live. And I wanted to hear, see some portraits of individuals living for this uh, uh, sometimes fertile, sometimes difficult, sometimes contact and conflicts in uh, Ukrainian-Jewish relations. There's a lot of stories like this when the book discusses music and art but, uh, and literature, and I appreciated such a large, large, large sections devoted to this. It's rare, actually, to see so much attention paid to literature and culture in a book written by two historians. I really appreciate that, but we always want more, right? So um, the book does not shy away from discussing controversial topics such as famine, Holodomor, World War II, and its memory of today's Ukraine and others. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the history of famine is uh, discussed in the book in quite some detail. It talks about famine as the Sovietization project, ultimately a result of Stalin's policies. Um, and it uh, works on debunking the myth that Jews uh, in their position as Soviet officials stood behind orchestrating the famine. That's all there. But it would be interesting to think about, and I think more research needs to be done on that, on thinking of famine, A, is a global European phenomenon. At that time, famine was in Russia, Kazakhstan uh, as well. But also, uh, thinking about Jews as victims of famine. I have to admit that I was not very familiar with the, uh, I was familiar with history of famine, but I was really not familiar uh, until I came to Toronto with this whole uh, memory of famine and how controversial it is, the Jews being involved in all this. I learned that actually in this room when I attended uh, some events uh, of the, our Ukrainian studies colleague when the, all this stuff was discussed. But the reason why I was not aware of this was that I actually studied 1930s of Ukraine 19, uh, and I interviewed uh, people who lived through famine in Ukraine. And the only people I interviewed were Jews. And to them, living through famine was one of the largest traumas of their life. And I have so many stories that I recorded how Jews suffered and through the famine, how they managed to survive, how many people did not survive. I also read those stories in a wonderful collection of uh, oral history interviews collected by Leonid Fimberg in Kiev uh, that has over 300 oral history of uh, Jews uh, 
um, living in Ukraine about that same generation where that topic is discussed in very many details as well. So I think that um, instead of debunking the myth saying it's not true, it would be really interesting to think about the diverse victims of the famine and what it means for our understanding of history. Now, um, one cannot study the history of Jews and Ukrainians without, of course, dealing with World War II and with what's happening today with its memory. I have a lot of questions about the World War II section and about the section that talks about the memory, but I'm sure it will come up in the discussion of others, and I will use my time later, if not, to talk about as well. But I wanted to point your attention to one aspect of World War II uh, in this book, which I really appreciated being covered. And it is the work of ethnomusicologist Moise Berigovsky, who spent the war collecting Yiddish uh, songs and Yiddish uh, stories of J survivors of the Holocaust in Ukraine. He has done this work in 1943, 1944, 1945. In other words, as soon as Ukraine was liberated, Berigovsky and his team went and talked to survivors. Often they also got letters from uh, Jews serving in the Red Army or living, uh, um, living in ghettos or hiding somewhere, writing songs about that experience. So it's, very, it's not very well known that Berigovsky was doing this during the war, and I really like the fact that the, the book uh, gives, uh, uh, pays attention to this man and to his project and to the Jew Cabinet for Jewish Proletarian Culture that was responsible for this uh, project. Berigovsky was arrested by Stalin in uh, uh, 1949, released 1955, but never, and, and died in 1961, but he never made public the fact that he collected this music. And um, why am I bringing up music when we talk about World War II and about Ukrainian Jewish cultural relations? Because the songs that he collected talk about nothing else. They talk, they speak, they're, they're in Yiddish. They don't shy away from topics that uh, we all want to shy away from, like collaboration of Ukrainians during World War II, how Jews and Ukrainians fighting together in World War II. They talk about uh, Hitler's desire to invade the Soviet Union to get access to natural resources. And all that stuff that we think is so contemporary, but actually it was very relevant in 1944. And um, because the book is so rich with uh, uh, illustrations of art and, uh, and um, uh, gives us a chance to look at this, but of course you can't put music in the book unless it's a very sophisticated multimedia production. I thought I would end my presentation by playing you one of these songs from the collection of Berigovsky that is, uh, has, um, that ha that's fully translated into English, as you will see. And that creates this bridge between the past, World War II, and the present. The music for this tune, this is how the document looks like, so you can see it from Berigovsky's archive. Um, the, um, as you will see from the words of the song, Ukraine appears proudly so in the Yiddish words. The tune is written by Alexander Crane, and uh, it talks about, it was written, it was recorded in 1944 from Velva Shagorotsky, and um, it is an important example of Ukrainian-Jewish relations that this it translates into today. It's performed by Pstoy Karalenka, a singer from uh, Moscow, accompanied by St. Petersburg-based Roma band called Loiko, and a number of Toronto musicians, Jewish and non-Jewish. The song proclaims loudly and clearly the eternal end of fascism, something that we all strive to see today. So if the technology is with me, you're going to hear it. Thank you. 
As you can see, Ukraine is a place firmly returned to Yiddish. There are still sites of violence, but the roles have changed. It is Russia now who is trying to get those lands, and Germany is trying to um, you know, do what it can to let, not let it happen. But the point is, Ukraine is there, and uh, culture helps us to think about the past and the future. Thank you. I would like to thank the authors and the organizer for, organizer for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Um, although the book focuses on the relationship between Jews and Ukrainians, I think that it offers broader insights and raises broader questions on issues concerning uh, relations between ethnic groups in general, uh, the, role, the role of violence and memory in national cultures, and the ties between diaspora groups and their homelands. So my remarks will touch upon some of these uh, issues, and I will share with you some of the insights that I took from the book. The book discusses the different, uh, histor the different histories of Jews and Ukrainians, but it also dwells on the various points of contact and interaction between the groups. And as a result, we get a useful comparative perspective on the experiences of Jews and Ukrainians. This comparison is one of the main themes of the book, but the discussion of Jews and, uh, Jews and Ukrainians also invites other comparisons. If we compare Jewish-Ukrainian relations to the relationship between Jews and other European nations, for example, Polish-Jewish relations, German-Jewish relations, French-Jewish relations, and so on, one striking difference is that Jews did not live under Ukrainian rule for the most uh, of the 20th century, because, of course, U uh, Ukrainian independent uh, nation state did not exist until the end of the, uh, of the century, except, of course, for the uh, short-lived Ukrainian state that was established after the First World War. This meant that, as opposed to other cases in Europe, where Jews lived as an ethnic or religious minority within the German, Polish, or French state, Jews and Ukrainians shared the same status as a stateless uh, minority whose fate was determined by more uh, other more powerful uh, forces. The picture that emerges from the book suggests that this shared status had a dual impact on the relations between Jews and Ukrainians. It contributed, contributed on the one hand to coexistence, reconciliation, and affinity between the groups, but on the other hand, this relationship also was also a source, source of conflict and animosity. As far as re reconciliation is concerned, it seems that the common narrative of Jews and Ukrainians is to a large extent based on the self-perception of both groups as victims of more powerful uh, forces. The central events around which the common uh, theme of victimhood uh, was built 
uh, or of course the Holocaust and the Holodomor, uh, although the Jewish narrative also includes repression under the Soviet regime. And indeed, both groups find or found, found or find, still find common ground in being, in being victims of the Soviet system. The book provides a lot of evidence for this type of connection. For example, the Jewish writer Vasily Grossman, who published a short novel that compared Nazism and Stalinism and created direct parallels between the Holodomor and the Holocaust. Another example is the Jewish American lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide in 1950, 1943 and referred to the Holodomor as, a case, as, a, as genocide, as an example of, of genocide. On the Ukrainian side, the book reports about the contribution of Ukrainian activists and writers who joined the Jews in Kiev in commemorating the massacre at Babin Yar. And it also, the book also, also mentions the efforts of, to commemorate the Holocaust in Ukraine, especially after 1991. These efforts include public acknowledgement of the participation of ethnic Ukrainians in the killing of Jews, the establishment of monuments, and the production of films and TV programs dealing with the Holocaust in Ukraine. So there seems to be a general conception of Jews and Ukrainians as victims. We learn from the book that Ukrainian writers of the early 20th century who integrated Jewish themes into their work saw Jews and Ukrainians as victims of history. Uh, it seems that this idea was expressed already before the Holocaust and the Holodomor in the early uh, 20th century. But also in the late 20th century, we have a quote uh, in the book from Ukraine's Minister of Culture who defined Jews and, and Ukrainians as, quote, two victims of history and of regimes which oppressed freedom. The alliance of victims, the alliance between victims, existed not only on a, theor on a, th on a theoretical level, there were also actual personal connections between Jews and ethnic Ukrainians that were based on the experience of oppression. One example provided in the book is that uh, in 1981, activists in Israel established the Society of Ukrainian, of Jewish-Ukrainian relations, which included former Soviet dissidents, underground Zionists, and prisoners who discovered Ukrainian culture through their fellow Ukrainian national, uh, nationalist inmates. These encounters, which took place in Soviet correction facilities, contributed to Jewish-Ukrainian understanding, to the forging of relations under a common oppressor. But the relationship to, with the Soviet Union had not only, unifying, not only unifying, but also a divisive effect. One of the sources of animosity between Jews and Ukrainians is the belief held by some Ukrainians that Jews were supporters of communism, and therefore, Jews were an integral part of the Soviet repression of Ukrainians. This accusation is one of the central uh, negative stereotypes that the authors mentioned at the beginning of the book. And according to one of the last chapters of the book, this stereotype was also one of the reasons for the barriers that have been erected between Jews and Ukrainians living in the diaspora, especially in Canada and the United States. We know that both, both Jews and Ukrainians suffered uh, from Soviet policies, not only in the 1930s, but also after the Second World War, where the Russification of the Soviet Union involved the repression of Ukrainian culture and nationalism. And when in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the Soviets also launched an anti-Jewish campaign. So we see that while th these experiences served as a basis uh, for reconciliation between Jews and Ukrainians, because they created a sort of an alliance between the victims, they were also a source of animosity, which was embodied in the Ukrainian narrative about the role of Jews in creating the Soviet system. In any event, the theme of victimization plays an important role in Jewish-Ukrainian relations, and it can be used to, to, be used to foster both reconciliation and animosity. Now, moving from the realm of narrative to history, we do see that despite the fact that both Jews and Ukrainians were minority groups who in many cases suffered from the policies of more powerful forces, the book discusses the various cases in which Jews, in which, in which Jews were subject to violence from ethnic Ukrainians. One of the most significant cases in this context was the anti-Jewish violence in the wake of the First World War. In 1919, about 50,000 Jews were murdered in a series of more than 1,000 pogroms in the territories of the Ukrainian National Republic. 
This was not a direct Jewish-Ukrainian conflict, as the Jews were attacked as part of the clashes between the government of the Ukrainian National Republic and its enemies, the enemies of the Republic, which included forces loyal to, the, to Soviet Russia, to some foreign, uh, some foreign army, armies and others. And the book indeed presents a nuanced, a nuanced and complicated account of this, these events. On the one hand, we learn that most of the pogroms were attributed to troops loosely connected to the Ukrainian government, while a much, a much smaller number of pogroms uh, were committed uh, by other forces, by non-Ukrainian forces. On the other hand, it seems that the troops acted, the troops attacking, attacking Jews acted against the orders of the political leadership. And the book also shows that the Jewish population residing in the Ukrainian state in, in, in that period, in the post-First uh, World War period, uh, enjoyed e extensive civil rights. The Jews enjoyed uh, civil rights, extensive civil rights under the Ukrainian post-war state. So if, we, if indeed the pogroms were committed by ethnic Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainian soldiers who acted against the position of the political leadership, it appears that in this case, Ukrainian Jewish, relation, Ukrainian -Jewish alliance or Ukrainian Jewish coexistence was a project that was promoted by political elite, by the political elite, by political forces from above, but was not rejected by the general population, at least part of the general population, as evidenced by the fact that Ukrainian soldiers attacked Jews uh, despite the, the, the official policy of the Ukrainian state. Other parts of the book also suggest that reconciliation between Jews and Ukrainians is more easily promoted in the context of of um, official political frameworks. It seems that the major steps towards reconciliation were achieved after Ukraine, after Ukraine became an independent state in 1991, at the time when the Jews, of course, already had their own independent state. The relevant examples in this connection are official diplomatic relations between Israel and Ukraine, economic connections between, between the two countries, the movement of tourists from Ukraine to Israel and from Israel to Ukraine. The memory of the Holocaust also plays an important role here. As I mentioned earlier, after uh, it gained uh, its independence, Ukraine developed a more open attitude towards uh, Jewish suffering during the Second World War, and it detached itself. Ukraine det detached itself from attitudes, from the commemoration practices of the Soviet Union, which tended to play down Jewish, su Jewish uh, suffering during the war. Israel, on its part, recognized the, the thousands of Ukrainians who helped to save Jews du during the Holocaust by declaring these Ukrainians, Ukrainians as righteous among the victims through Yad Vashem, Israel's official institute of Holocaust commemoration. So maybe one of the conclusions from the book is that Ukrainian Jewish relations benefited from the rise of independent nation states for these two groups, national sovereignty, added self-confidence and material means to promote coexistence, while also minimizing the frictions that existed when Ukrainians and Jews lived as, a mi as minority groups on the same land. And I would like to conclude with, uh, by mentioning one, one very interesting group that was discussed in the book, ethnic Ukrainians living in Israel, uh, who are mostly spouses of Jews who immigrated to Israel as part of a large immigration from the former Soviet Union during the 1990s, so ethnic Ukrainians, non-Jewish uh, spouses of Jewish spouses, spouses who immigrated to Israel. This is an example of very close personal connections between Jews and Ukrainians, not dependent on political institutions. And it is also very interesting because in this group we have, an ethnic, we have ethnic Ukrainians living as a minority within a Jewish state, which is one of the ironies of history that the book reveals. Thank you. More and more, everything that happened before the 20th century begins to disappear. And I'm very grateful to the authors of this book that this, th these periods do not disappear in the book. Secondly, I am North American born. Uh, and uh, that is of some significance because starting in the 1960s, I was involved in various discussion groups between diaspora communities of Ukrainians and Jews in the 1960s, largely in defense of Soviet political prisoners, and that was perhaps the best period that I remember of this, uh, and later over many other issues. 
I also, like one of the authors of the book, Professor Magochi, was at Harvard at the point that Elmoyan Pritzak, who was director of the Ukrainian Institute, and Shmuel Ettinger, one of the leading his, uh, Israeli scholars of Eastern Europe, formed a close friendship and dialogue groups. And I want you to remember that. Those were dialogues between the Ukrainian diaspora and Israel, not between the Ukrainian diaspora and the Jewish diaspora in North America, and certainly had, had nothing to do with Ukraine at that point. And we can deal with those later. But back to the topic of, of our major topic of our, our discussions today. I would first posit that there are two major narratives or paradigms in two historical periods that largely define what we might call Ukrainian and Jewish visions of Ukraine. The first will be the early modern, that is the end of the 18th century, largely a social narrative and somewhat national. What was the Ukrainian narrative? Ukraine was the land of freedom, where the population resisted serfdom, rose up in arms under the leadership of the Cossacks, and was able to put off the imposition of slavery serfdom on much of its population for much of that period. It also led to the formation of an independent or semi-independent Ukrainian state, the Kozak Hetmanate, and to the clear flourishing of a distinct Ukrainian culture, the culture of the Ukrainian Baroque of the late 17th and early 18th century. As Jews fit in this narrative largely, they were proponents of the oppressive regime of the Polish-Lithuanian state that was trying to impose serfdom on the population. The Jewish narrative. Ukraine was the land of milk and honey. Salaboron called it the Ukrainian volcano. He called it that because he said Ukraine offered Jews ability to live in a way they had never had before, to take up all kinds of new positions, but this was a terribly dangerous thing to do, and it often led to violence, that is, uprisings from the population, and therefore death of, and destruction of Jewish community and of Jewish populations. That Jewish narrative largely would argue that Jews brought economic and civilizational progress to Ukraine. That's my first early modern paradigm. The second ones, modernization, emancipation, nation, and state. That is the period of the 19th and 20th century. The Ukrainian narrative, social emancipation, above all the abolition of serfdom in the 19th century, finally freed up the possibility for much of the Ukrainian population to take part in advance, both socially and culturally. The 19th century was a period of Ukrainian national awakening. There was a struggle for civic and cultural rights. And then in the 20th century, the major narrative is the formation of statehood, a Ukrainian state. Jews are frequently seen as groups opposed to the social and cultural advances of the Ukrainian population, particularly in the rural areas and uh, often opposed as Jews assimilated to Russian, Polish, and other cultures to a Ukrainian state. Jewish narrative. Emancipation, above all, Jews receive coming late in Eastern Europe, first in the Habsburg Empire. That is, above all, civil emancipation and ability to live in a liberal, more liberal society. For parts of the Jews of that time, this is also the assumption of identities of the peoples and states in which they live. That is, as they become Frenchmen in France, they to a degree become Poles and Russians and Germans in much of the territory of Ukraine. There is an active Jewish secular culture, but that this is the rise of a new kind of virulent anti-Semitism in Europe, which Jews become, Jews become victims to, and in a certain way, Zionism, that is, the search for Jewish nationhood, is a response. The Ukrainians are a backward population in these zones, a dangerous one, and often rise up to destroy Jews and Jewish communities. Now, I bring those narratives because dozens, hundreds of good Jewish, Ukrainian, and historians who are neither have written and provided much additional information that undermines these paradigms, that shows that they did not always apply, that shows the dangers of generalization and stereotypes over long historical periods and trying to go from an early period to a later period. And many of them also wrote counter to what we might call their national paradigm. That is, you have people like Pantelimon Kudish, Ukrainian historian who goes absolutely against the general Kozakophilia of Ukrainian historiography, and many 19th century Jewish historians who saw the, the Jewish role in Ukraine as socially regressive and regretted this. 
There are dozens and hundreds of other possibilities. Now, why is this still this volume you have before you a breakthrough? And I think it's a major breakthrough. And I think it is for a number of reasons. First of all, we have two eminent scholars of this field, both of whom have devoted their studies not only to the one group, but as they can to the to the other group as well, and to more general situations. So the, this is the great present we get from their work. But above all, I think they break down the issue of always studying Jewish-Ukrainian affairs as relations, and particularly for moments of conflict. What they present before us, above all, to the Ukrainian reader, broadly so, who is the Ukrainian reader? Those who know Ukrainian history better, they present the Jewish narrative of the Jews of Ukraine. That is, one can only read those sections and avoid all the sections on Ukraine and even avoid the, the, the relations sections and get a perspective of what happened with Jews in Ukraine over a longer period of time. And I would hesitate to say, for those who know Jewish history, uh, in which Ukraine is only a background or, or at times a place of danger, they can, they can look at what the Ukrainian perspective is. And in that I think they have done much. They have challenged us to engage the other fully, to try and look uh, from the, the, the other's perspective, and to look at the other's studying oneself and the other, other dealing with the other group. <coughs> And I think that's a very valuable part of this book. And above all, they provide context for those difficult moments, those hard stories, the things that we may at times, for the sake of dialogue, wish to avoid. Because once one provides context, uh, one can place those events and understand that, that despite their tremendous significance, they fit in what we have, have labeled in this book coexistence. Now, then uh, a criticism that is in a way not a criticism. My problem with the term ethnic Ukrainians one finds in the book. That is, uh, frequently you read through and you find Jews and ethnic Ukrainians do this and Jews and ethnic Ukrainians do that. First of all, as a historian, my great fear. Can one picture what new histories of Austria-Hungary will be like if this method is uh, taken on? We will have ethnic Slovaks and ethnic Romanians and ethnic everyone in the book. Our books will become much longer, uh, clearly through this, uh, if one follows uh, this uh, method. Uh, I understand why it was brought in, and it was brought in, I think, for a very noble purpose. Uh, it, 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 it wants to be inclusive in some way of the other groups who lived on the Ukrainian territories and therefore wants to see possibly that the name Ukrainian can apply to all of them. But did they historically? Or are really we talking about the history of Ukrainians, whether they were called Ruthenians or whatever in an earlier period, the Jews, two peoples. Studies of ethnoses or national groups is after all quite respectable. Uh, Ruszewski, who I work on quite a bit, uh, deal, dealt with this greatly. And really, is it applicable before 1917? That is, uh, 1917 is when, in many ways, Ukraine as a territory takes on borders in a, in a mean, more meaningful sense. Uh, and finally, or is it applicable before 1991? That is, when one has a Ukrainian state. Did it not take that Ukrainian political entity to finally shift it? And then we also divide, and here I go on really thin ice, the problem of ethnic Jews. 38,000 people on the Canadian census declare that they are ethnic Jews, but not Jews by religion. Canada has adopted a different vision of who Jews are from the US. In the US, Jews are only a religion, and it is unacceptable to view them in other groups. In Canada, you, there are two possibilities to answer Jews on the census, your religion and your ethnicity. And of course, Eastern Europe has long viewed, and in some ways, Ukrainian, many Ukrainians viewed Jews as a nation before Jews viewed themselves as a nation, as we well know from the Zionist movement and, and uh, the context with Ukrainians in the 19th century. And then finally, when do the categories emerge of Ukrainian Jews or Jewish Ukrainians? That is, are these terms used yet? When are they used? Can they be used? They are clearly used in North American Jewish Canadians, Canadian Jews. We know that they can be used in Poland in many ways. Will they be used in Ukraine? And what I would argue is what they are telling us is about something that largely is coming, 
It is, being, it, is, it is coming at our time, and in this way the book is very useful. That is, I am willing to put up with too many of those ethnics, maybe if, it, if the point can be made, uh, although I question it. And then finally, when we can see uh, where this really will come about, uh, we have a project on the Holodomor, also funded by the Temerte Foundation, the same group that funds, uh, funds the Ukrainian Jewish encounter. And we have, over the past 30, 35 years, done a tremendous amount of new research on the Holodomor. We know much more than we could. One couldn't do it as long as the Soviet Union existed. We now, we may debate numbers of how many people died, but we can say that good demographers come up with four to five million. Some people view it as somewhat more. We know how many people died. We know much more about how and when they died in Ukraine. Uh, of those four to five million, uh, the overwhelming majority die in three months of 1933 when all foodstuffs were seized in Ukraine, which made Ukraine diverge from much of the Soviet famine. We also know that Stalin at the end of 1932 decided that the Ukrainian Communist Party was getting too uppity, uh, that Ukraine was showing signs of independent existence. And while there were famines in Russia, it appears quite high, highly likely that Stalin decided to have all the foodstuff seized in Ukraine to in some ways bring Ukraine to its knees. He was bringing Ukraine to its knees, but that meant he was bringing all the population of Ukraine in rural areas to its knees. That is, this special treatment of Ukraine came because Ukraine was Ukraine. It was above all aimed at Ukrainians in the way he was seeing the political sense, and many of the members of the Ukrainian government were of Jewish background as well. And they were all to be brought to their knees. And Ukrainians and Jews, the two groups we talk, or the ethnic Ukrainians and ethnic Jews, die in that famine. Uh, the, we now know much more about how people die and when they die. We are beginning to even know about groups uh, down to the point of, say, Mennonites, who are a great, uh, great segment of the population. And indeed, we find that they ha the groups have had different trajectories. It was not all the same. The Mennonite committees in the West got aid through, bribed, bribed Soviet authorities, and Mennonites were saved during the famine because of the organization of, of Mennonite groups in the West, we now know. Uh, and we may know more as we study this. But it is also, therefore, I think, the beginning of what we can see happening since the Maidan. The Maidan has changed uh, the entire, I think, uh, civic national makeup of Ukraine. The Ukraine has become in many ways a civic nation. The Jews of Ukraine have variously reacted to it. Some Jews died on the Maidan fighting for the new Ukraine and other Jews still see themselves as, as Russian Jews or are willing to listen to Putin. Fortunately, they are less willing to listen to Putin than many people in North York are. I think in certain ways the diaspora groups tend to be, as usual, retrograde in their views, and we find much more debates, I think, going on in North York about what, whether Ukraine should be a state or not than we do among Jews in Ukraine. But for Ukraine itself, uh, that offers this new opportunity. And so while the ethnic Ukrainians may not fit, I think, for all the historical periods, particularly before the 20th century, uh, we have great hopes it's going to fit for the future. Thank you. They call me an observant heretic, and I would like to prove that I am. So what I would like to do, I would like to share with you some insights into how I came to write to co-author this book. But before I say that, I would like to mention that Bob Magoji was presented here as the other co-author of the book, to make sure it's I am who is the other <laughs> He is not. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can do many things. Uh, they asked me in history department at Northwestern, Jochenam, can you define yourself professionally? I say, I am the strongest historian in history department. And then there is a pause, and my 33 colleagues are absolutely silent, flabbergasted by my chutzpah. And then I make a pause and I say, I can do 25 push-ups. So, <laughs> now, among people who helped me to discover Ukraine, where I was born, were many Jews, and some of them were Canadian Jews. 
and some of them were Toronto Jews. In 1991, I am uh, a professor of Kiev University teaching Latin American literature, Spanish Baroque literature, uh, philology of medieval Spanish, um, uh, different courses on theory of literature from Plato to Lotman, and other stuff which has no relevance to our today's discussion. And then I get a call, and uh, the person who I have who I have heard about, Joseph Zissels, um, tells me that there is a person coming from Canada, from Toronto. He's a journalist. Uh, his name is Sheldon Kirchner. He is. Um, a, a prominent figure in a uh, Jewish community, and he needs a translator who would go with him to different uh, Ukrainian political figures because he wants to interview them about Ukrainian Jewish relations. Well, I was a Jew, born in Ukraine, raised in Ukraine, educated in Ukraine and Russia. I don't think I ever asked a question where there is such an issue as Ukrainian Jewish relations. I knew that the issue exists, but whether relations existed, it was for me rather a question of personal relations with Ukrainian writers, authors, uh, that, I never, um, so, that I never saw through the prism of ethnicity. They were friends, they were interlocutors, um, members of the extended family. Sheldon comes to Kiev <clears throat> and says, Yohanan, I need you to take me to different people and um, I also need you to translate for me, and it'll be simultaneous translation, and we will work uh, for a couple of hours of each of them. I say, okay, let's go. So who we went to? First, we went to Larissa Skoik, who in uh, 1982 became the first president of the Society of Ukrainian-Israeli Relations. And Skoik spoke for an hour about the importance of Ukrainian-Israeli relations in view of the two nation states that were mentioned today because Ukraine has something to learn from Israel. And it was, it was quite a discovery for me. I never thought that Ukraine as a country, as a new post-colonial country, can learn something about itself looking at how Israel emerged as a post-colonial country in 1947-48. Then we went to Dmitro Pavlichko who was, uh, I believe, some, one of the prime ministers at the time. Um, Pavlishka had many different functions and uh, a very highly positioned figure. The only thing I asked um, Sheldon not to mention who is his translator, because Pavlishka knew my father, Pavlishka knew the family, so, and, and I was not a great admirer of this person. So Pavlishka was talking to Sheldon Kirchner about the importance of Israeli Jew, of Israeli-Ukrainian and Jewish-Ukrainian relations because he wanted Israeli missiles to launch Ukrainian Sputniks to Cosmos. Third person was Yuri Shcherbak, who in a couple of months after our meeting had to become the first ambassador of Ukraine in Israel. And the conversation was, of course, about new understanding of Ukrainian-Jewish relations, about um, anti-Semitism, about President Kravchuk going to Brussels, presenting um, the issue of new Ukraine to the European uh, countries, and actually saying that, uh, yes, Ukrainians acknowledge uh, their guilt before Jews uh, for the atrocities uh, committed during the Holocaust, uh, whatever was the political um, context of this statement, whatever its historical um, accuracy, I wanted to say that at that time it was astounding, because I believe from all the Soviet republics he was the only one who did that. And then of course we went to Zuba, um, excuse me, to, to Ivan Drach, uh, who was at the time the head of the Ruch movement, uh, representing uh, the um, national, um, national-centric uh, movement within the Ukrainian uh, political context. All these people spoke about Ukrainian Jewish and Ukraine Israel relations, and it was a revelation for me. I realized I am getting into something from an angle that has a meaning. What is the meaning? Why am I allowed to look into the subject matter as if I am in it? Because I'm translating 
but I'm also not in it, because I am keeping the distance between this people and Sheldon Kirchner. Sheldon leaves, goes to Toronto, publishes, um, I believe, 15 or 20 uh, different interviews in Canadian Jewish News, which at the time, I don't know how it is today, but at the time it is the um, Jewish newspaper in North America with the biggest circulation. Um, among those interviews, you'll also find uh, an interview with me, but you know, who am I then, who am I now, it doesn't matter. Sheldon allowed me to look into Ukrainian Jewish issues. And he also told me that he will, um, he will introduce me to another person who is coming also from Toronto, also to Kiev, to do something very different, and who can be helpful in my future endeavors. This person who comes in a couple of months is Barry Wolfish, who is the custodian of the um, ancient books and Judaica collection at the Roberts Library. Barry comes to Kiev. Uh, we spend time in Kiev and in Lviv working with the newly declassified collections of Judaica manuscripts and books. It was a revelation for me that Kiev has about 10,000 uh, Jewish books published anywhere from the 16th to late 19th century, um, that Lviv has about several thousand books published in the 18th, 19th century. These are huge, important collections. Um, Barry helps me to master uh, the um, knowledge of, uh, Juda of uh, bibliography of Judaica manuscripts and books, and he also shows me that Ukraine has a trove of Jewish history that I know nothing about. I'm taking Barry through the hills of Kiev, and we talk about what I am doing at the university, what I am doing as my hobby, my new hobby, Judaica manuscripts. And Barry says, so what are you planning to do in the future? And I'm saying, well, I'm interested in combining my previous um, degree in uh, um, Spanish, Spanish medieval, Spanish philological studies, and my interest in Jewish studies, I would like to do something on Sephardic Jews before they are banished from Spain, before they actually become Sephardic Jews. So Jews in Spain, medieval times, um, 711 till uh, 1492. So from the times the Jews came to Spain till the expulsion. He looks at me very seriously and says, why don't you study Jews in Ukraine? I was thrilled for two reasons. First, I thought it's, it's a very non-interesting subject matter. And second, I thought, what do I know about that? I am much better in Spain than in Ukraine. But it takes time, you know, from 1920, 1992 till uh, 2016, you know, I move intellectually in a good direction, as one of my friends said, but very slowly. So it takes time. Right. Third person was a rabbi whom Barry introduced me to in Kiev, who was not a Canadian, who was not from Toronto. He was from Bnei Brak, um, an Israeli rabbi, whom I took around Kiev. Because these people wanted me to show them Jewish and Ukrainian sites in Ukraine. We are standing in front of the official monument to the Babi Yar massacre. At that time, there is just this official mon monument with the three memorial plaques. One plaque in Ukrainian, it says, in this place, the Nazi invaders massacred 100,000 peaceful Soviet citizens. The second plaque says the same in Russian, and the third says the same in Yiddish with nine typos. <laughs> we are standing in front of the Russian plaque. Ukrainian there, Russian there, monument in front of us. The rabbi on my left. Two young people, a boy about 20 and a girl about 18, are standing and looking at the plaques. And the girl asks the boy, I understand this is Ukrainian, this is Russian, and this is what? And the boy answers out loud, I don't know, maybe it's an Armenian. I was shocked. I momentarily translated the conversation to the rabbi. I was really shocked to what extent people are oblivious of what is really going on or what really happened there. And I realized 
that memory, or better say, the absence thereof, might be extremely dangerous. And something has to be done for the people who are coming to this monument and to this place would never forget that this is not Armenian. This is actually Yiddish. And Yiddish because of the 33,771 Jews killed on this place in two days in September 1940, uh, 1941. And among these people were the mother of my grandmother and the sister of my grandmother. And the brother of my grandmother managed to, to get away. Last person who I want to mention was also Jewish, and he also discovered, helped me to discover Ukraine in an amazingly interesting and innovative way. This person lives in a ghetto in Jerusalem. He knows that non-Jews exist, but he probably never saw them. First time he goes out to the country, he goes to Kiev to work with Judaica manuscripts. And he asks me to take him to different Hasidic sites of Ukraine because he is an ultra, ultra, ultra orthodox Hasid. He walks with his big uh, fur hat called Strymel uh, in his long silk capota. Uh, he has um, short pants and white socks and looks like a person from, uh, well, I would say fall of 1725. I would say winter 1726 will be already, you know, the fashion of half a year later will be too fashionable for him. <laughs> I take him to Uman, to Ruzhin, to Brody, to Lemberg, to Vizhnitsa, to Kuti, to Kosov, to Medjibosh, to Berdichev. And then, bored with all Hasidic sites, he says, I would like to see something genuinely Ukrainian. Okay, let's go to opera, I say. And I take him to the opera house. September 1992, Kiev Opera House starts its uh, season with Taras Bulba. It's a great opera to watch with a Jew. As you remember, there is a very important uh, plot about Taras Bulba, his two sons, uh, one of his sons um, is uh, a rebel who is captured and killed by the Poles. Another son of his uh, is marrying into a Polish family. Uh, Taras considers him a traitor um, and, um, you know, kills him. Uh, there is this very interesting family plot about Ukrainians versus the Poles. Poles are the oppressors, Ukrainians are liberators, and they are also Jews who do not appear uh, on the stage. But they do appear in Taras Bulba, in the original text. Menachem Mendel, let's call him Menachem Mendel, after all he was a Menachem Mendel, goes with me to the opera house, and uh, all the opera house looks at him, not at the stage, because he is in the strimo, he has his silk capota, and he sits next to me. And he gets very interested and very excited about the plot, to the extent that by the end of the second act, he already identifies himself with the Cossacks, with Taras Bulba, with his suffering, with this um, opposition Ukrainians versus Poles, to the extent that he just whispers to, into my ear, please continue, continue explaining what's going on. So I'm, I'm trying to look at the libretto, I'm catching the words, you know, when the Ukrainian language is beautiful, when it is, uh, sung, but I um, cannot capture exactly the words of libretto, transferring them into the ears of Menachem Mendel. People uh, murmur left and right, just shut up. And, and because, you know, they are listening to the music, he is watching the, 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 uh, what is going on. And then at a certain moment, when there is a famous scene on the stage, Andri, the son of Taras Bulba, marries a Polish girl. And I explained to Rabbi Menachem Mendel what's going on. Menachem Mendel leans to me and says, what? He marries a Goya? Azoy <laughs> Erba Chef didoziki Goya, says he. So, at that moment I understood 
that the Ukrainian Jewish encounter had a past and has a future. Thank you. I guess all I can say uh, is that uh, um, since I am older, I have to try harder. <laughs> and every morning, I do 25 push-ups, 25 sit-ups, and uh, pardon, knee bends, and 60 sit-ups. So who's stronger of the two? How about you? But despite the energy within my body, uh, I will not stroll around in the Frank Sinatra style. <laughs> Uh, because um, I have a few things uh, that I'm going to note here that I can refer to. And you're not from Chicago. <laughs> and I'm not from Chicago. Uh, but I've looked at my watch, and so uh, my uh, decision would be, which would have been at the very outset, to say next to nothing. Uh, reason being, I mean, what does one need to say? We, we've just written this book, and one can read the book. Whatever one has to say is already uh, in the book. Uh, but because I am a professor, and we are paid to say, we are paid to talk, uh, whether we know something about the subject or not actually is irrelevant. We're expected to answer questions and comment on something. I know a little bit about the subject because I re do remember at some point writing this book. Uh, and uh, I was reminded even more just now by uh, some of the comments of our uh, distinguished uh, readers, to all of whom I am appreciative, because this becomes a function of comparing and contrast what one had in mind as an author what one expected to be conveyed, and what has been received. You never know what's going to happen with that which you write, how it's going to be perceived, understood, etc. Um, actually, in many ways, uh, since you were quite nice, I have to say, uh, they, it, it, you both got some of the message. And, uh, and commented on some of the things that are useful to still reflect upon. Uh, I remember that uh, for many years I had an, a, uh, an assistant uh, working for the Chair of Ukrainian Studies uh, who was a female and who, as we say in the modern world, sensitized me to women uh, and sensitized me also to antiquity. As a result of which, I started to write more about ancient Greece and ancient Rome, uh, and, and uh, well, early Byzantium, I did study Byzantium by nature, but uh, the importance of antiquity in the evolution of Eastern Europe en général, and specifically uh, in, in Ukraine. I also put in much more in my second edition of the history of Ukraine uh, about women. Uh, Actually, didn't think about it. I thought I was sensitized. Uh, but now we have a reader who see, sees, and probably correctly so, I don't have the book. I was about to take the book, open up the index, and look on the women and see how many pages are there. I, I don't remember, but probably not. There probably is not enough about uh, uh, women and their role in society. And this whole question about uh, violence during World War II and, uh, or during the pogroms and sexual, sexual violence in particular, actually I never, I would never even have dawned on me. See how unsensitive some of us can be. Or it's not even a question of unsensitive, it's just a question we just don't know. We don't think about these things. We all live in our own little frameworks, if you will. Uh, as I said, I don't want to speak long because it's on, we're moving on and, and there probably some of you have some questions. Uh, just a, one or two other uh, uh, comments. Uh, the, the, there was also, uh, this is again from Professor Stanchis uh, talking about the famine and we heard about this as well from 
uh, uh, Professor uh, Sisson, uh, this, this disaster, disastrous event of the 20th century um, affected people. Didn't make a difference whether those people were ethnic Ukrainians, I'll come back to that in a second, uh, or Russians, uh, or Jews. It affected whoever it swept over on the territory of Ukraine during those terrible years. And actually, the highest percentage of people who died from the famine in Ukraine were ethnic Greeks. It was a big Greek population. And where did they live? Almost exclusively in the steppe lands. Uh, so I'm glad that that was noted. Our colleague, Professor Yehuda, touched on something which uh, raises the more general issue of what this book, or what I thought this book was supposed to be about, in which he took away from his read the issue of Jews and Ukrainians as victims, Jews as victims, Ukrainians as victims, you know, the whole martyrology phenomenon. Much of the discussion today from our colleagues, with the exception of Professor Stanchez, but even she as well, talked about history. This is going to come, perhaps, as somewhat of a surprise, perhaps. But just like I had nothing to say because I've already written the book, but on reflection, given a choice, I wouldn't have even had a chapter at all on history. It's too much history. Too much talking about history. Too much emphasis on history. Too much ploying and toying as if this is the only aspect of life, of society. To my mind, this book and its uniqueness, and from which I learned most, I don't believe it. Good, you haven't heard anything. That's fine. From which I learned most was the art the art not only of Jews, but Ukrainians as well. The opera, the symphonies, the sculpture, the literature, the linguistic evolution. These are the mortars of civilization and life. And not simply, alas, political structures, which more often than not, in certain circumstances, lead to destruction. But if we focus only on that, we come away with a truly distorted perception of history. So maybe it's best to throw out political history and just talk about cultural history and let the reader ask, well, was there anything else going on? We've had so much of disaster. We have had so much of death. What does it tell us about life? What does this tell us about existence? It just tells us more detail. So uh, the only other thing I would like to mention is the use of the term, and this is to end on a fun note, <laughs> well, fun note, but with my uh, uh, colleague a professor Sisson, with whom we've operated for decades together. This idea of why we're calling, or why we've used the term ethnic Ukrainian. Well, do you know the reason why we use the term ethnic Ukrainian, actually? In this particular context, in this particular context, many of you li living in Canada, and also in the United States, know about these um, about to say treason trials, I can't even think of you know, these investigations about war criminals. We've heard a lot about it in the Duchenne Commission in Canada, uh, the various committees that were established by Congress to investigate this. And very often, among the war criminals, 
very often, among the war criminals that were being looked at were, were war criminals from Ukraine. And there were several examples, now we've all heard of Ivan Demenyuk, fine, okay, clearly ethnic Ukrainian, right, wrong, guilty, not guilty, part guilty, not, that's ethnic Ukrainian. But many of these others who were up on charges from Ukraine turn out to be ethnic Germans from Ukraine or ethnic Russians from Ukraine. So when you're telling a narrative, how are you going to make this distinction? And besides the fact that this book was designed not about all the inhabitants of Ukraine, it's very specifically ethnic Ukrainians. And so from that reason, we use that term. And how would one rewrite a history of the Austrian Empire, which of course we all love because we're all descendants of Franz Josef, or those of us who have been privileged to have been so. And that includes Jews, whom Franz Josef loved and cared for as his people. We, had to, we, we don't have to worry about using ethnic uh, because the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was ethnic, but we do have to do one thing. So you don't have to talk about ethnic Slovaks, ethnic Romanians, ethnic Hungarian, or ethnic Magyars, or actually you do have to use Magyar, not Hungarian. Uh, uh, but the real problem is, is Germans. You never should talk about Germans when you talk about the, the other people in the Austro-Hungarian, they're Austro-Germans because they're distinct from Germans. So in that sense, you don't really have a problem in writing the history, a new history of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And for the fact that ethnic Jews exist, of course ethnic Jews exist. And, and, and that's not the Canadian uh, census uh, uh, that did this for the first time. Uh, uh, the Hungarian census did this in the late half of the 19th century. The Czechoslovak census is in the interwar <laughs> period where you had Jews by religion and Jews by ethnicity. In, and it's very interesting to study this to see what the relationship is between those numbers. Actually, for mo mo in most cases, they come out being more or less, uh, more or less uh, equal. And of course, there are people who prefer to just identify themselves as ethnic uh, uh, Jews by ethnicity as opposed to by religious tradition. So let me, uh, first of all, just finish by, uh, by thanking uh, uh, actually all of you for spending the time for reading this. And for all of you for coming uh, and listening to us talk about this book, um, we tried our best. And you know, hopefully that might filter through to present and future readers. Thank you. Thank you. Should we take another question? No questions? Yes, okay, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, my question uh, follows on something that uh, Professor Margachi said and Margaret she said. The, it concerns the so called Ukrainian police. Okay. There was uh, the, in every country that the Germans occupied, there was a police. Now, my question is, who were these people? I mean, there were no Ukrainian police in Poland before Poland fell apart. 
there was no very few ethnically conscious Ukrainians in the Soviet police. They were would have been by, regarded by the Ukrainians as traitors. And of course, uh, what then? I, I read once a book about the called Hitler's willing execution. And there, the author actually tells us who were the members of the Einsatz group, the people who actually did the shooting. What's the question? The question is, what is there a source where one can look up, for example, the makeup of the so-called Ukrainian police, or more probably, properly, police in Ukraine? One more question for Mr. Brown? Go ahead. Thank you. As a, as a child of immigrant uh, from Poland, I uh, was brought up on a steady diet of the Ukrainian. And we know, and it's complicated, the amount of collaboration the Ukrainians did, but again, it's complicated because of their struggles to be an independent country. Uh, against another horrible dictator. So, as a Jew, how am I to view this collaboration of the Ukrainians with the Nazis? And there was a great deal, obviously, but for different reasons. Okay, so I think our colleagues, as you like, whatever order. Uh, I thought we will be asked something about art. <laughs> about a great Ukrainian artist, Tatyana Yablonska, who is in the book. Or about literature and great Ukrainian poet, Lesya Ukrainka, also a woman, who is in the book. But let me get to difficult issues. First, all three questions are one question. All three questions touch upon a subject matter which is being researched, discussed, and debated as we talk about it. One of the most important and most interesting breakthrough in our understanding of the Holocaust was precisely in this subject matter. What I suggest doing, um, you can uh, follow what I'm saying and take notes. Well, if you don't take notes, uh, I would not fail you at the final exam. But, I do strongly recommend taking a book uh, res relatively recent, which is edited by Wendy Lowy and Ray Brandon, which is called Shoah in Ukraine. It is the first, the most comprehensive and most interesting book on the subject matter in the English language. Available with excellent articles on collaboration, among other things. This book tells us something important about um, Einsatzgruppen and um, um, Hilfspolizei. So you, if you are interested, I just refer to the book. Second thing, I do think that everybody who is interested in this subject matter should take by all means and read recent book by Timothy Snyder called Black Earth. This book reminds us of, of, of a very important thing. We cannot compare a collaboration of French in France of uh, Dutch in Holland, um, of um, uh, Italians in Northern Italy, once Northern Italy is occupied by Germany, uh, or Hungarians in Hungary. We cannot collaborate this to the collaboration of Ukrainians, Poles, Lithuanians, and Belarusians for a simple reason. Most Western European countries are there. Most public social institutions are there when the Nazis come and occupy the country. When the Nazis come and occupy, when the Nazis come and occupy East Europe, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are destroyed as states. There is no state, no state institution, no diplomatic court. There is nothing there that you can call a state. So that is a very important factor in our understanding of why things happen and what actually happens and how it is done. Three. Christopher Browning has a wonderful book where he discusses one particular 
uh, unit of policemen, mostly from Germany, rank and file Germans, who were made to do a dirty job of killing. And Christopher Browning, uh, who I'm once in a while teaching back to back, says something very important in his article published in a volume edited by Peter Hayes and called Oxford Handbook in Holocaust Studies, which I believe is the absolute best handbook. Um, it's this thick, 50 articles, introducing you to each and every aspect of the Holocaust that has ever been published. Christopher Browning says, you will be amazed if you actually find out how little units, how little people it took to destroy, to kill, to massacre six million Jews. Jews tend to think that, you know, why the Nazis are doing that? Let's send these people to the front and they will be killing the Russians or, you know, the Americans when the second front is open. Actually, it takes very little effort. It doesn't take much in terms of uh, the wagons that are used to send uh, Jews to Treblinka, Majdanek, Auschwitz, and other places. It doesn't take many people to guard these places. So let's not talk about you know, the scale of collaboration, which is uh, proportional to the massacre. It doesn't work this way. And I, this is not what I'm saying. This is what the expert, the top expert in the field is saying. And he is not Jewish, so I respect him more than my Jewish colleagues. It's a joke. The most important research in this issue of collaboration was actually done by a young scholar from Kharkiv, whose name is Yuri Ratchenko. He published just a couple of articles, and I heard his presentation at Kharkiv at an international conference, Jews in the Multi-Ethnic Mosaic of Ukraine in 1914. Um, Ratchenko asked the question which was asked today. Who were the people who made Hillsborough in Ukraine? And he found out an astounding thing. One word, Hilfspolizei, was not an ethnic group. It was a geographical group. That is to say, Hilfspolizei, Ukrainian Hilfspolizei, Ukrainian Hilfspolizei, in German documents, is a group of people which is drafted in Ukraine. And that's it. And it has a huge amount of philosophy of the Russian soldiers who defected to the German side. We absolutely forget that 1 million, 1.5 million Russian soldiers were fighting for the Third Reich armies during the Second World War, defecting from the Russian side or, you know, from the Soviet side. So, so, thank you. So, there were Vlasovsky, Russian soldiers, Soviet soldiers, former Soviet soldiers. There were Hungarians. There were Poles. There were, yes, Ukrainians. There were also Belarusians. So Ukraine, Ukrainian Hills Polizei is not necessarily an ethnic Ukrainian group, something extraordinary that we have to understand. Rachinka, Snyder, Browning, Lowy, Brandon. These are people who help us understand what is going on. <coughs> what I'm conveying to you right now is not my research, it's my reading. I very strongly recommend folks, read the books. They are existing there on the shelves of the Roberts Library for you to take them and to read them. Anyone want to add? Yeah, if I could just add uh, on the word collaboration, which has become, I think, uh, a word that's very emotive. And uh, I think sometimes it, it makes us forget you know, what the essence of what we're talking about. So let me just pose rather controversially. If you were in Western Ukraine, in former Austria and Galicia, uh, when did collaboration of population start? So the elite, the elite of that society tried to set up a state, they failed. And then they wound up in a Polish state in which everyone who wanted to keep their job had to betray the national cause and take an oath. Anyone who wanted to stay in Poland and have a job of that elite had to betray the Ukrainian cause and collaborate with the Polish regime. And then in 39, the Soviets came, and contrary to what President Derevich said, there were, I think, there were many Ukrainians who served in the Soviet police who were local Ukrainians. 
uh, in villages, they did, they, they, they had support. But for many of them, it was their second collaboration. And then the Germans came in 41. What I'm trying to say is it was a very different story from the Netherlands, right, where you had a national state, most people were loyal to the state, the state was destroyed by the Germans and Nazis, and then you collaborated with the victorious Nazis. Because you were not betraying your state which didn't exist, or you were, and you had also a population. Now, we may find out, we tend to, to, to emphasize the ON and the groups who don't collaborate with the Polish state, in, largely, but in, in when we discuss our struggle. There are those who don't, and they become part of the story. But it makes the uh, whole issue of collaboration a, a much more complex issue in, in, in Ukraine and in much of Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. I wanted to ask a question, actually, as far as this um, comments. Um, all three questions that we'll ask now dealt with World War II, as um, uh, Johanna mentioned. Essentially, it was one question. And you know how people read books today, nobody reads from the first page one to page uh, uh, to the last page. You must have thought that people will start opening the book at World War II section, or not. What, how did you think people would read your book? What is the most important part? Well, the first thing that people do when they pick up a book uh, if, is to look to see if there are any pictures in it. <laughs> it's really as simple as that. We all do that, and it includes scholars. Scholars might, might, it's really a question here whether they look at the footnotes first or the pictures. But clearly, it's a, you know it's a battle between these they two. They look to see if they're cited. That's ah, right. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. There's, there's another another yes another criterion. But pictures is high up on the list. And so, yes, we want to make it a pretty book, a beautiful book, a quality book, which both of these peoples deserve and particularly to their cultures. If I picked up the book, and I flipped through it, and I see some of these paintings at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, then I would say, ooh, I didn't expect that on the territory of Ukraine, there are painters, modern painters. I mean, don't they only kill people there? And isn't there only, you know, Chernobyl and all of these kinds of things? And so, as a result of that, I would look at the chapter on art. Um, or, if you flip through the book, you're going to be struck by this great picture of this Ukrainian actor, uh, uh, Stupka, Bogdan Stupka, who plays Karas Gulbe in one film, and in another film he's playing uh, Teddy the Milkman. Great, great photograph. Oh, look, this is, and I saw reading the thing on music. So, that's what I would have liked and I believe will happen. Just because some of us only have a fixation, I won't use the word fetish, but I will, on World War II, on destruction, that doesn't mean that everyone does. So my goal or our goal was to wean the people away from a stereotypical approach to the past. And some of them will, in your particular world, well, you just mentioned it. I went out of my way to pick a beautiful photograph of Yulia Tymoshenko, who no longer wears the braids. Actually, I think she looks even more attractive without the braids. But, but, what's the whole point? The whole point here is that this is part of traditional culture, which you're so interested in, and to show that it exists in this very city. I'm intimidated. No, no, I know. You said that. You said no. Traditional culture. This is traditional culture. So yes, uh, that was the goal. To draw people in to all of these aspects of the particular cultures. We have another question here and another at the back. Yeah. He'll just bring you, wait, wait till he brings you the mic. Oh, yeah, here. Well, 
Uh, my name is Vera Rodell, and I'm not going to be speaking for UJE because we have a number of members of our team here, including Bob Mogashi, who's on the board, a colleague, and uh, I won't mention everybody, but there are people who can also speak equally well uh, for UJE. But I want to make a very brief comment. First of all, Yohanan, you made me think of a change in the text of Big Million and Henry Higgins. The rain in Spain falls mainly in Ukraine. <laughs> so thank you for that. But, yeah. Well, sorry. So, uh, but I did want to say that this handsome book, this distinguished volume, is very much the work of the two co-authors. It is not meant to be the definitive work, the last word on World War II. Very complicated story. The National Archives of France, for example, had only last year, what they named the two years ago, a massive uh, exhibit on collaboration in France. Many things that were not known, but it was scientific, it was educational, it was political, it was administrative. Uh, very complicated story, and we're only at the beginning of really deep research. So, one of the main tasks of the Ukrainian Jewish counter is to shine a bright light. But our aim really is to enable positive, fruitful work together in the present and future of Jews and Ukrainians, whether it's the diaspora, Ukraine, Israel, but that's the main object. But that requires shining a bright light on our history so that we understand it. That we understand ourselves as well as the other. <coughs> so one of the uh, great, as it were, gifts of the book is enabling Jews to look at the story of Ukrainians, Ukrainians to look at the story of the book. And that, I think, was the objective of the authors. What the story of World War II and difficult parts of our history will be, still, that story still needs to be told, and it will be one of the objectives of the Ukrainian Jewish encounter to enable that story to be told accurately, truthfully, and empathetically by bringing together the world's top historians from the different schools and places in where people think about these things. I want to say just one additional thing, if I'm allowed. Very, very, very brief. Very briefly. So one of we the have things, another question. One of the things CJ is doing is helping the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum tell the story of the broader impact of the German occupation on the broad Ukrainian population, which includes not only Jews, but it also includes forced papers, displaced persons, etc., etc. There's a lot of work to be done, so watch this space. Thank you very much. And one question near the back, you'll see on the right-hand side. I think the oh, wait. object of this book... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Excuse me. Actually, it was not you, but the woman further back who had her hand up. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Sorry, we'll come back to you. I'm going to leave the 20th century in front of the 19th century, to some extent, because you know, oral history was mentioned, and this is the oral history of my family. Um, there, it was mentioned that authors like Sholem Alechem did not mention Ukrainians. They talk about Russians. And that is the reality, reality of my ancestors that come from two, you know, different branches, one from an area called Kherson or Gerson, and from, um, well, uh, it, it, from just the name escape is the area that is, is a small republic that was half Moldavian, half Jewish, and it's a area. A lot of Jews came from there. And in reality, all the my grandparents spoke Yiddish as the main language and Russian. Ukraine was not part of the of the people that they knew. And how do I know that they didn't know Ukrainians? Because after reading Unquiet Close to Dawn, in which there is the description of the Cossacks programs, I guess my grandparents and my mother was that their their reality. This way no, we had programs but they were not the Cossacks. There were others because, I don't know, Ukrainians didn't seem to be part of their world. 
where they live. So my question is, and I am happy actually when we talk about Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians, I know what we're speaking about. People that speak the Ukrainian language, have a particular church and cultural heritage that I should know more than I know, I guess, but I understand the meaning of it. But what is Ukraine? What is territorial Ukraine now? I know what is now, but what, it, what was in the 19th century? Was it the same as now? Is Kherson and the area north of Odessa Ukraine then? And that's the reason maybe Sholem Aleichem didn't mention Ukrainians. Maybe there were not Ukrainians there. I don't know. That's my question. Thank you. And if you just pass the microphone to the gentleman in front of you, then you can have the last question. I think the object of this book was a reconciliation between Jews and the Ukrainians, even though both of the groups were Jewish. Yesterday, a lady stood up and said, there is an elephant in the room. And I think the crowd knew very well what she was talking about. I would say to you that what should happen in the Ukraine may be what happened in South Africa where Nelson Mandela was not looking for revenge and the black, the white people were not looking for domination. The Ukrainian people, and maybe they've even started this in Babiyar, to acknowledge to the Jews what happened there and the Jews should say, we forgive you and let's start anew. That to me, without reading the book, of course, is what may be missing. Okay, I think if you all agree, we'll allow our panelists to respond. We are here in a mixed audience. Some of us are uh, students, some of us are not students, uh, but, but professional students of scholarship or scholars. And then we are here with people who are not part of the scholarly world. And so that's why it's useful to say now what I'm going to say. The first thing is, is, is that I'm unaware of any scholar who uh, would have the pretension to believe that he or she uh, are writing a definitive work. Scholarship by definition is not definitive. Scholarship is nothing but an effort on the part of an individual or individuals to find out more about a particular topic and contribute to the store of knowledge. There is no such thing as a definitive work. Um, some would say it might be considered in the category of something that everyone has to read as a starting point to learn more. And certainly not anyone serious going to start off thinking we're writing the definitive work. Of course not. Aside from the fact, people, this is a popular book. This is not meant for scholars. This is meant for the public at large, written by scholars in a popular language. And as someone mentioned last night, shockingly, no footnotes. Well, yeah, of course no footnotes. There are serious essays or serious books written without footnotes. It was done deliberately. It was done deliberately to provoke already the kind of discussion that is being provoked right here. This book also did not and could not, we can have the pretension of we are going to be a court of reconciliation, that we're somehow going to, through a book, bring people together but the gentleman in the back, 
posed an excellent question. Hasn't read the book? Please go out, get it, read it, because you've already started the process without even reading the book. That is, the book hopefully will provoke individuals who have read it to think about things that they hadn't thought about before, and in the process learn about some, some of their neighbors or their friends or whatever that they didn't even dream of. Uh, so please, you've already started the process without reading the book. Uh, the gentleman is showing you the way. We're going to close this session. The books are available outside. Thank you. But perhaps our colleagues, wait, 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 we're not closing yet. Maybe our colleagues had something more to add to respond to any of the questions. Can I have so just one question about the general theme of the book? Do you see any major differences in the ways uh, in which Ukrainians and Jews approach the possibilities of reconciliation today? Um, let me say something which a lot of people are not going to like. But that's OK. Or let's put it this way, not agree with. And then some of them may not even like my saying this. And I said it before, and I've gotten a strong reaction. The problem of strained relations, so-called, between Jews and Ukrainians is a phenomenon of diaspora. All diasporas live in the past. Their mindset stops from the moment that they, or their parents, or their grandparents left the land from which they left. And either they do one of two things. They adapt and assimilate totally to the society in which they live, whether it's the United States or Australia or England or Canada, and forget the past because who okay, cares? We're Canadian. We're not, who needs this crap from the past, from another place? But then there are others who are weaned by their parents, by their grandparents, by themselves, rediscovering at some point. But they have a very distorted image. Because they never lived what went on, A, in the past, and they don't even have a, a clue of what these societies are. There is no problem, actually, between Jews and Ukrainians in Ukraine today. First and foremost, they don't even think in these categories to begin with. How can you have a problem when you don't even think in these categories? What is there to reconcile? The only thing that there is to, if you will, reconcile is for Ukrainian citizens of whatever ethno-linguistic background to build a civic society in which they identify with their country. And part of building that civic society is looking at all aspects of its past the good and the bad, and paying due respect to Crimean Tatars if they suffer, to Jews if they suffer, to Poles, which they should be doing if they suffered on the territory of Ukraine, and to ethnic Ukraine, etc., etc. But this is not even, I didn't, I didn't even use these, I slipped into the, to the dialogue here and use ethnic categories. No. We are all one people living in one country. We are concerned with building our country, with self-respect for our country as a country. And that all the events have to be looked at, should be looked at, should be remembered, regardless of ethnic distinction. So the whole question of reconciliation or kind of fixing poor relations between groups, this is Ukraine of 2016. This is not Ukraine of 1944 or 1917 or the end of the 19th century. Any other final comments, remarks? In that case, now we really can thank our speakers, and I welcome you all to the reception.